So we wanted to talk a little bit now about rescue. And this is uh, basically something that we'll be talking about in relation to uh, a worker who is in a personal fall arrest system, either a, a rope grab and a lifeline or a self-retracting lifeline. They've fallen, and what do they do? And we'll talk a bit about self-rescue and, and assisted rescue as well. So um, as we talk about it, one of the first things we may want to do is you may want to look at the OSHA standard and see what it says because that might give you some direction as to what you have to do specifically. What are the things that you have to comply with? Well, this is the OSHA regulation, so it's not going to help too much because there's not a lot of detail there. It just says that, that the employer has to provide for prompt rescue of workers in the event of a fall or has to make sure that those workers are able to rescue themselves. So it doesn't tell us specifically what we've got to do, and it doesn't even tell us what this means. What does prompt mean? How much time do we have under the rules to get that worker out back to safety? So there, as you start thinking about this, as we developed this program, and this program was, was developed originally under an OSHA grant as part of our, our uh, day-long fall protection class. We included uh, information on rescue. So we, we looked at this as something that's really part of your fall protection plan, part, something that's part of your fall protection training that has to be done. So it's something that uh, it really can't be addressed at the time of the fall. It has to be addressed uh, in advance of that because there's going to be things that are going to have to be done. There's going to be equipment that's going to be needed. There's going to be worker training that's involved that workers have to know about techniques that Rich is going to demonstrate in a little bit. Uh, and what are the, some of the hazards that they have to be aware of because there's, there's uh, once that fall protection equipment has done its job, that worker is still or can be in jeopardy. And so that's why it has to be something that's envisioned as a plan. Uh, one of the issues that we uh, come across a lot is what about that worker who is working alone? Uh, do, what does OSHA say about that? Does that mean that uh, that service crew has to comprise two workers? Is, is that what the OSHA regulation says? And OSHA hasn't addressed this in the regulation itself, but it's addressed it in letter, letters of interpretation where they have said uh, that single worker doesn't have to be joined by a coworker all the time, but that worker has to be able to call for help. So two-way radio or a cell phone. Unfortunately, what's the one thing we don't know about the condition of that worker who's fallen? Yeah, are they conscious, are they unconscious? Because studies have shown a worker or any person who's unconscious cannot make a cell phone call. <laughs> so the significance of having a radio, a cell phone, is really eliminated when that worker is incapable of using it. And there can be a lot of things. It, it isn't just being unconscious. It could be that that worker who has gone down has broken an arm and cannot even reach into the pocket to get that, that cell phone. So uh, from OSHA's standpoint, telling you to have a two-way radio or a cell phone isn't probably the best idea because that's not going to necessarily help that worker in every instance. What we have said is that uh, it's important to call 911 as a first step. And it may not be something that that team that responds, that 911 team that responds may be helpful towards getting that worker back up or back down. But we know that because of the nature of a fall in a harness, that worker has been subjected to some trauma. So that worker at the end of that episode, whatever, they, after they get lowered down, raised back up, they're going to have to be looked at by EMTs. So it's going to have to have professional medical care look at them because there could be some internal injuries there that you're going to have to have somebody look at that worker to make sure he or she is okay. So the thing is about uh, the folks, the EMTs who respond, where would they like to, in all you know, optimistic situations, where would they like to have that worker when they pull up at the job site? on the ground, right at the curb, if it could be, you know, right where they pull up the ambulance, they would like that worker to be right there. So they may not be as, as useful in terms of what they call those high angle rescues, getting that worker who's, say, suspended on a 15, 20 story building down or back up. And it could be that the resources that are on the job, your team, your roofing workers who are still there, may be your best resource if they've been trained at some of the techniques to get that worker back up or back down. So again, that's going to be part of the rescue plan that's going to be significant. 
The thing that we're worried about, the thing that we, we talk a lot about is this concept of suspension trauma. And it, it goes by a lot of different names, orthostatic intolerance, orthostatic incompetence, or orthostatic shock. And, and it's, it's something from being basically in that static position. So that worker has fallen, being suspended by the harness, but isn't capable, say, of moving or moving their legs and getting some, some activity there so that the blood is coming back to their brain. What we don't know about is this, the, the time factor. Uh, the, the amount of time that it takes to, to rescue that portion, that person, and what exactly does that translate to in terms of uh, the damage that could be done in that amount of time. So OSHA doesn't say specifically, except in one instance, they say that in a situation where a worker has been exposed to electrical energy or an energized circuit, so a power line or some type of energized circuit, they say that that rescue has to be performed within minutes because they're worried about the impact of that electricity on the worker and they know that if electricity has been, that person has been subjected to electric current, they're worried about what? Heart rhythms, right? So if rescue isn't performed in a sufficient amount, of, in a quickly, uh, that that worker could die. So that's the one instance where, where OSHA says the time is, is, is specific as to what the rescue has to be accomplished in. in. In other instances, we're talking about a prompt rescue. And prompt rescue is going to vary depending on the nature of, of that condition of the worker. What we're worried about is that worker who is unconscious, who cannot do anything to help himself or herself. We're worried because we know when they're unconscious, our window to save them without having further damage has closed significantly. So that's why uh, we, we, we are concerned about time, even though it may not specifically be stated in the OSHA standard. What happens in suspension trauma, and I, I won't go through all of these, I'll give you kind of a, a quicker version of this, but as that, as that worker is immobile, their legs are, are basically immobile, they're not doing anything with the muscles in their legs to help that blood go back to the brain. And it's kind of something you see often in, in newsreels or something, news uh, film, where uh, the president is reviewing the troops or the Queen of England is reviewing the troops and one of them just does this, just faints because they're, they're basically immobile and what's happening to them is the same thing that's happening to this worker. The blood is doing what? It's pooling in the legs because they're in that static position. So it's not getting back to the heart as easily and if it's not going to the heart, not as much as going to the brain. So what happens is gravity is kind of this person's enemy even worse if that person is, is unconscious. The blood is, is uh, not getting to the heart, so initially the heart is going to, what, beat quicker because it wants to get more blood up to the brain. But as the volume of blood that, that collects in the legs uh, rises, there's going to be less blood that's being pumped, so the heart then is going to say, well, I'm not going to keep beating faster because I've got nothing to pump. The heart then will slow down. So now the worker is in this bad cycle where the blood is just immobilized in the legs. And this blood now in the legs, it's not oxygenated, so it's got toxins in there, so it has to get back up to the blood, to the heart, to, so that it can be cleansed by the lungs, get up to the brain, and get that, that uh, person who, if they are unconscious, maybe back to consciousness. So what we worry about is, in these situations, is the additional injuries that could cause a problem. And one of the things Rich is going to demonstrate when he gets up here are some different ways that that worker who uh, can get out of that static position, obviously if they're conscious, to try to get their legs up closer to their chest so that that blood can be pumped more readily to their heart, to their lungs, go to the brain. So it then extends the time that that worker has for either self-rescue or an assisted rescue. So these are kind of the concerns that we have about the exact uh, trauma that could be induced. And some of the signs that that worker might experience, you can see here that there could be fainting, shortness of breath, nausea, dizziness, sweating, hot flushes, paleness. This, this last one, the narrowing of the field of vision or the loss of vision is going to be something of real concern because we know if that worker is experiencing that, if those who are rescuing know that this worker is complaining about the not being able to see things, we know now that that's, that's a, 
being caused by the lack of blood going to the brain. So that's going to be an indicator that now our time window has really narrowed. Uh, so this is going to be one thing that's going to be significant as that person is, is suspended. So the two basic elements of rescue, the thing that we want to do, we want to delay that orthostatic shock. We want to give that person as much time as possible so that they can do that self-rescue or we can have people there to get that person out. And then bring that fallen worker to a supporting surface. Either bring the worker back up, lower the worker back down. Now generally, what's going to be easier to do? Is it going to be easier to bring the worker back up or lower him or her down? If you, if you lower them, what do you have to do? Suspended in a, in a harness from the lifeline or from an SRL. To lower them, you've got to do what? You've got to unhook. Okay, so that's where things get dangerous because if that worker has to be unhooked, we have to make sure that we've got what? Something else holding them. Okay, so that's going to be critical. So to, to lower the worker down, it's going to involve somehow unhooking the system that he or she is on and having that supplemental system, that rescue system, able to, to lower him or her. And we'll show you a couple things, though, that can be useful for that. But to bring that worker back, back up, they never have to be unhooked. So it could be an issue of manpower. If you have manpower on the job, somebody has gone off the job, and if you have two or three uh, folks there who could basically just do a mule haul and get that person back up, that may be the easiest because they've never unhooked. The issue there is those, whatever, three, four workers who are pulling that person back up, they better make sure they get them all the way because going down a second time is not going to be pleasant because that system that maybe decelerated the fall previously is not going to be in place or it's going to be at least deployed in some amount that if they lose them on a second time, the, 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 uh, the arresting of the fall is going to be more painful. Yes? So if there's another problem, all you've got to do is not unhook them. Unhook them all in. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great question. So those persons who are doing the rescue, they have to be protected from falls as well. So they can't be leaning over the edge trying to save the person who's fallen when they're not wearing PFAs or have some type of system attached to them so they don't fall. So that's a great point, that they have to be sure that they're protected. So you can kind of do one guy at the real side tied off, and you can do like a system, two guys to, behind that. You don't have to have all three guys at the real side. Yeah, so that as they... And then they're outside that six-foot thing. If you get them outside the six-foot area, they mm -hmm. can pull it from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this gets to kind of the planning aspect because it's going to be different on this roof versus, say, another roof or another instance, but it's going to be some of those things that uh, if you plan for it, workers are talking about it, and they're saying, here's how we would do this in this situation, or this might be something that you suggest as what to do exactly. So some of the things that why it's important to plan for that is just precisely what we're talking about here. What are the things that you may have on site that could be used? Are there ladders? Are there aerial lifts? Things like that. But more importantly, if you're planning for it as an employer, uh, what do you need to buy? What are the things that you might think are the best things to use, whether they're descending devices or some type of pulleys or things like that, that may be useful to execute an assisted rescue? And we'll show you some more pictures as we come up. So, so the rescue equipment is something you have to think of in advance. And there was just, uh, I think it was two years ago on OSHA's website, uh, there was a rescue that took place. A, a worker fell off the side of a building, was suspended in the harness, and somebody went and got a, a forklift, put a pallet on the forklift, raised it up to that worker, and basically just gave that worker a platform to uh, stay on until EMTs came or more people came, on, came by so that then the suspension trauma was relieved because now that pressure wasn't on that person's uh, body. So here's some of the stuff that might be useful. Uh, this, and we don't endorse anybody's product, we're just showing you this as possible options that you could use. This is a harness with an integrated uh, rescue system in it. There's a tab back there that once that person has fallen, again, hopefully they're conscious, 
that they can pull that tab and then that will descend them the length of whatever land, uh, line is in there to the ground or to the lower surface. This is kind of a similar thing, but it connects to most harnesses. So it's an add-on feature that performs that same rescue technique on any type of harness. And this, we'll, we'll demonstrate this in just a little bit. We actually brought that with us. That's a SRL that has a rescue feature. Uh, some of these rescue poles, these are if, if you can extend that to possibly get to that worker, hook up that supplemental line if you can by connecting to that D-ring and then perform a rescue technique there. And the same with this. This is just a different manufacturer with some additional equipment. This is kind of a come along that goes with it. But you can see this is something that you have to think of in advance and workers have to be trained to, to use that. When that person is hanging there, you don't want to get the instruction booklet out and start reading exactly what you need. This last one here is a, uh, basically like a come along that would connect to an SRL cable. So if you had a, 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 a wire rope cable like in the SRL we have here, uh, one of it attaches to the anchor side, the other attaches to the, to the worker side, and that through mechanical advantage, even a worker who weighs, you know, whatever, 60 pounds, could rescue somebody who weighs 200 or more by just using the mechanical advantage of that come along. So we'll let, let me show you this. So we've, if you'll notice, this can be set. We have it set right now in, in basically fall arrest. And so what this will do is it'll work just like any SRL, where it'll let that worker go out and move freely if that worker moves at a slow enough speed. When the worker moves too fast, which would be something that would happen if they fell off the roof, then this is going to lock up quickly and it has to lock up in two feet under the OSHA rules and that's that will basically arrest that fall. But if you want you can s switch this to basically perform the rescue. So it's also again going to allow the worker to move at, at that slower rate of speed but if that worker falls it's going to do the same thing. It's going to lock up but then it's and I hope I don't hurt Rich here but it's going to automatically lower that worker down by his or her weight so that it basically performs the rescue. So there's a couple of cool things out there in terms of equipment that manufacturers are making and the beauty of this uh, fall protection industry or safety industry is there's a lot of different equipment being made or being designed every year with different uh, features that can be useful in a lot of different situations. This one is 50 f feet, yeah. So you can get this one with 100 feet as well. The issue there will be, what are you lowering that worker, or what is he or she being lowered into? So you got to make sure that there isn't something down below that could injure that worker. You don't want to have an injury by the rescue. Uh, so you have to be a little cautious so about that. That would be set right. Again, part of the planning process, part of, part of your pre-job. So some of the self-rescue strategies, and we've talked about cell phones and two-way two radios and the limitations. There are some self-rescue lanyards that are manufactured. There are suspension trauma straps and slings. Rich is going to also demonstrate uh, the suspension trauma straps, which we have on this harness, which one of the most economical things to do, and they're useful for a worker who is either in a rope grab and lifeline or in an SRL, and they're very inexpensive. They're about $20 for the pair. They're kind of universal. They just basically loop around uh, one side, one strap on each side of the harness. So those are kind of useful. And again, it's going to delay that, that time that that worker has to either perform the, the self-rescue or get the assisted rescue. We'll also demonstrate a lifeline loop uh, to show you how that exactly works. There's also a Prusik loop that involves having a, a separate piece of cord uh, with you, so that's not always as, as easy to, uh, to uh, put into practice. And we'll show you a foot wrap. We have a couple slides coming up that kind of demonstrate some of these things. So this is the self-rescue lanyard, kind of more uh, an item for, let's say, a, a warehouse application or industrial application, because that worker uh, basically gets this ladder deployed from the shock pack after he or she has fallen. That ladder deploys and that worker then can either climb back up because this ladder is attached 
way up here where the anchor is so that worker could climb back up, meaning he or she doesn't have to do what? Unhook. But if he or she has to go down, that means what? He's got to take this thing off because he's not going to be able to go down while he's connected to the rest of the system. Now, and, th and that comes with its own dangers because that person who has just fallen has to have the wherewithal to do what? Get your feet in there as you're hanging there. So it's, you know, it becomes somewhat of a circus act to try to be able to do that and still maintain your stability. These happen to be the suspension trauma straps that we have on this harness. Uh, it's basically, basically looks like a jump rope that goes under your feet that you connect up. There's another type here over to the right that's basically a single strap that you put one foot through. Uh, so those can both do basically the same thing. discussion earlier about being prepared for this stuff. I mean, we're going to show you these things and, and, and the, the loop and the ladder and everything, but having your staff practice this stuff is really well worth it. I mean, because it's e relatively easy to do, but until you get, as you see, and it's, I hope some of you will try it, but these options here in, in particular, I think are really, really good options, but you need to know how to use them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. The middle one in particular is great. Yeah. Very tough. Yeah. It's uh, precarious. Yeah. You know, when we demonstrate that self-rescue lanyard, it's it's hard to do when you're just standing still and you haven't been subjected to a fall to try to get your foot in those. And those things open up like a stirrup. They open up kind of like if you're done horseback riding, they open up and they stay pretty open. But it's still a challenge to get your foot in there. And yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And if, if you've unhooked, it's nerve wracking because that's all you've got. Right. So you can't lose that thing. And if you get tired, a couple feet down, that's still all you've got, you know. They're hitting it with the, the one on the left, the other the loop, the bird shot, right, and even the one on the right. The problem is getting your feet in those things, right? And, and just I want to reinforce it. And again, that this middle <laughs> one, which we'll show you, is, uh, and, and they're relatively inexpensive, mm -hmm. really a good one. They're all good, but I mean, at least that one is. Yeah, the nice thing about any of these, and and maybe the the, the only thing you do is you get those. Uh, uh, straps that are against your legs that are preventing that blood from, from getting back to your heart, you take that pressure off. You'll be able to more easily get into your pocket to get that phone or get that radio that you can maybe do something then, call for help. Uh, so that'll help a bit just to take that pressure off those leg straps. We'll also demonstrate this. This is kind of an easy thing to do if you have lifeline next to you. So if that worker has sufficient lifeline alongside of him or her after the fall, they can take this and, and make a knot in the line and basically just stand in it. It's kind of simple. Rich will demonstrate that. There's a more complicated version that's called a foot wrap that you do something similar. You wrap that lifeline around your foot uh, and then you place both feet in there and stand up. <laughs> it's, yeah. And, and again, as, as Tom said, this is something, you know, we've done this a fair amount of times, but as we demonstrate it and we get folks up there who've never done it before, it takes, you know, five or ten times to get comfortable doing this. And that's in a classroom setting where we haven't been exposed to any trauma bouncing down a roof or hitting a chimney or whatever it is that happened. So all of these are going to be challenges for that worker to try to accomplish, but you, they have to have some practice at it. We always say that, that because one of the issues is that you may have to be unhooked to go down, we never want that person to cut that lifeline or cut that lanyard unless we're, we're absolutely positive that the supplemental equipment, the rescue equipment is in place so that they're, they're held by something. Cutting one of those lines uh, is, can be problematic and it can be, you know, it can be, cause death if 
they're not connected to some other system. Uh, after the fall, this, again, this kind of goes to the issue of uh, calling 911. We want that person looked at even if they say they're okay because it's a traumatic event. It's something you want those EMTs or medical professionals to look at. The, one of the issues, and, and this is uh, uh, something that is, we found in a couple different sources, health sources, is because that blood that is pooled in the legs hasn't been oxygenated and it contains a lot of other toxins that are removed by the lungs when it goes up to the heart and is, it, and is oxygenated by the lungs, that if that worker is laid down, that that quick release of all that toxic blood to the heart could overwhelm the heart. So there's some, some medical folks who have done some research on this and said it is better that that worker be kept in a sitting position and not laid flat right away. The, the problem it, that that could cause is that that worker who's unconscious, that's going to be a little more difficult to do depending how, on how much manpower might be at the job. And it, if you have oxygen there, that's great. The, the other issue is when those EMTs come, they're going to do their routine how they do it. You know, they're not going to be asking the roofing crew likely for suggestions on what to do in terms of, you know, how to treat that individual. But it's, it's something that workers should be aware of that uh, if that worker's been there a long time that they may not want to just go into a laying position. The other important thing, again, part of an OSHA regulation is that uh, personal fall arrest equipment that's been subjected to impact loading has to be removed from service. So we have a picture up here on the, uh, on the top and Rich is kind of passing around what a SRL shackle or snap hook looks like after it's been subjected to a fall. And you can see in the after, after this, you'll see a kind of a red ring there or a red washer that's been exposed. And that's an easy way to tell with an SRL if that person has been subjected to a fall. So for example, with this SRL, this one has never been subjected to a fall, so this piece hasn't moved. What would ordinarily happen is if there were pressure put on it for a, from a fall, like that one that you're getting, this piece is going to drop down and you'll see a, a ring there and usually it's a red ring, it might be orange, but that's going to be the indicator that tells you that that thing has been subjected to a fall. And it, the same with, with uh, some of the other equipment that workers might wear. You know, it's easy to see that the stitching pattern on these harnesses have a very unique pattern and it's done for the integrity of the harness, but it's also done as like a telltale. So when these, these, this pattern is disturbed, when you see frays coming out of there or you don't see this spe specific unique pattern, this stitch pattern, that's going to indicate to you that that harness has been subjected to a fall. It's been subjected to impact forces from the fall. And a lot of times with some of the harnesses, there's actually a, a portion of the strap that's kind of overlaid. So it's sewn kind of in this fashion where one piece goes like this, one piece is like this and that's sewn together. And it's, it's obvious to the wearer that that piece then opens up when it's been subjected to a fall. And I believe this, this harness may have that right here. But that's something to be aware of that all workers who are wearing PFAs should be aware that their equipment has indicators on it, has things built into it by the nature of the manufacturing process that indicate that a fall has occurred. So all of that gets taken out of, out of uh, service until it's been determined that it uh, is, is still okay. In the case of some SRLs, this SRL, the yellow one, is an expensive one. That can be re uh, reconditioned uh, at the factory. It's certified again. Some of the less expensive SRLs, uh, those once they're subjected to a fall, they're basically garbage and they get thrown out. Some of the more expensive ones, they can be reconditioned. And of course, harnesses, when they've been subjected to a fall, when that stitching is broke, that's a piece of garbage now too, and that should be gotten rid of. Uh, you know, as we do our, our rescue portion here, we're, we're, gonna rich, we're gonna have Rich in this harness, we're gonna lift him up just a little ways. Uh, there's no reason to really lift a worker any higher than really necessary to perform this stuff. We, we know that you know, some people may have different techniques to lift that worker. There's no reason to get that worker, you know, three feet, four feet, five feet or more off the ground because the techniques you're using you can do with just six inches of clearance from the ground. 
So if you do something that, that uh, puts that worker in harm, uh, you got to make sure there's other backup systems in place, whether it's attached to an SRL, there might be a net underneath that you're going to practice something unique. So uh, be cautious when you do some of that uh, training that, that those workers are protected. One last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, any worker who is in a personal fall arrest system, uh, they should really understand the concept of calculated clearance, and it's described here on this slide, uh, and these are the components that go into it. So those workers have to be aware that in some instances they may need, as you can see on the side, 16 to 18 feet of clearance before that system is actually going to deploy effectively and safely so that there's enough clearance between them and the ground that the lanyard can open up, that the, their free fall has been included in that distance, the, the stretch, the elongation of the harness, and the, the worker's height is all accounted for. So any worker who is using that PFA system has to know these factors, these things that go into the safety of that equipment. And a lot of times we see, and I, I'm sure you guys may see as you drive around and look at jobs, Workers who may be in a PFA, but have maybe 20 feet of additional lifeline just laying on the roof, laying on the roof surface, and they may only have what, like 10 feet of clearance off the edge of the roof. Well, if there's 20 feet of loose line, the math has basically worked against them for their safety. So they've got to be aware of these numbers and how, it's, how it affects them, because the harness and the lifeline will do nothing if there's too much uh, uh, play there. That's my biggest fight when I go up on the rest of these guys is they want to have as much working area that they can do to have the raptor cart yes. up. And another thing is they'll have the raptor cart up and they'll have it 10 feet from the roof. And then mm -hmm. they'll have 30, rope, 30 feet of rope going out so they can run this big distance. And I'm always telling them, you can't. If you want to do that, you need to move the raptor cart back so you're on a 45. And that's exactly how, you know, that's my biggest thing with these guys is move the cart back. I mean, I know what you're trying to do, but the cart back and you got way too much slack. Yeah, and it, a lot of folks uh, who use carts, I don't know if they understand the significance of that angle. What, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is when that angle becomes too great, the effectiveness of that cart is reduced. So if they go, yeah, so if you think of it as uh, a clock face, you don't want to be too far past like eight and four, uh, you know, towards 12. You don't want to be in that direction because that's going to minimize the effectiveness of the cart. And almost all carts are like that. They have a working area that, that you have to well, stay within. Set things up right. That's my biggest, trying to educate them on the whole use of the cart and the rope and everything. They must not even be tied off because you're going to flat on the ground. Yeah. And we, we, we don't have, uh, we talk about it in our day-long fall protection class in terms of swing fall hazards uh, that are significant as well. So all of that kind of comes into play uh, is the system going to be effective in not just stopping the fall, but is it going to stop additional damage, say, like in a swing fall situation? So it's something that they have to be aware of that clearance factor for this, but the swing fall can also be a problem in the nature of that anchor point is going to be rendered useless by the fact that they have that, they're working at too great of an angle to the anchor. So what we'd like to do now, if you, if you don't have any questions, we'd like to have Rich maybe demonstrate some of the things that you can possibly use when you get back uh, to show uh, workers what they might be able to do in self-rescue situations. So uh, we have maybe five things that we, we'd like you to, to at least try uh, at, back at your shops, see if your workers can uh, practice them, or at least be aware that this, these are options that they can use. Uh, and, and might be helpful if they're in a self-rescue situation. If you're going to use some of the assisted rescue stuff, that's something you're going to have to kind of research. We'd be glad to help you with it, to find manufacturers. Um, but uh, with the self-rescue stuff, we'd like you to see some of this stuff so that the workers maybe have a better idea of what exactly they have to do and what they have to practice. So with that, we'll take a second to set Rich up in the harness, and uh, we'll, we'll come back and demonstrate some of those uh, techniques. All right, so right now what we're going to do is cover a couple of the rescue techniques or self-rescue techniques and those techniques in which we can prevent that uh, orthostatic shock that Harry was talking about earlier. 
Um, so what I've done already is we've already gone through the harness, we've already inspected the harness, and we've made sure that it's, that it's in good working order and there's no defects on it. Um, a couple things that we're going to do today is I'm going to actually use my phone. I'm going to show you. Uh, I, we had some uh, polling from the audience, and they decided that back pocket was probably the one that they would most likely have it in. So I'm going to put that in my back pocket right away. I'm going to show you the difficulties at which it might be to actually try and get your phone out of your pocket when you are in a fall situation. Behind me, we have our tripod, our handy-dandy tripod that uh, Harry and Tom usually uh, hang me up, and then they leave the room and walk away on me. Uh, but what we're going to do today is actually we're going to hang in this. This is simulating a, a, a couple different things. What we're going to try and do is simulate that we have a lifeline on it. We actually have a rope grab on this so that your rope would, in a fall scenario would be hanging beside you, or at least should be hanging beside you. And we're going to use a couple techniques that are going to be there to, to show you some of the rescue techniques. A couple things that we're going to talk about uh, is we're going to do the foot wrap, we're going to do the lifeline loop, and then I'm also going to show you the, the packs that we were talking about earlier on the sides to show you how they work. Um, so with that being said, I think we'll get me uh, up in the air and we'll show you some of these techniques. Now Harry's going to be alongside of me to hopefully keep me straight instead of me swinging around in circles so that I can talk directly to you. already feeling somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, so here's a couple of different things. If you notice, if you notice the uh, chest strap already is kind of close up to my neck, although when I first positioned it, it was down around here, correct? So what I'm going to do is readjust that real quickly, just get it back down a little bit so it has me in a better position in, in a false scenario. Secondly, what you want to notice is that, notice the tension right here. Uh, this is the largest artery in your body, your femoral arteries. And what's happening right now is someone used to see in the old westerns, they're creating a tourniquet and they're wrapping the stick. Well, right now, that, that strap right here is actually cutting off that, that uh, blood going down to my legs. So it's doing two things. It's pulling it back up and, and it's preventing it from coming back up to my heart. So we've had a fall. We're in a situation where we are conscience, uh, conscious and we have the ability to somewhat self-rescue or at least uh, help with a cumulative trauma disorder or the orthostatic shock. So as you can see, I've fallen. I'm here in a situation kind of leaning forward a little bit. Um, the strap is a little bit raised uh, above my back there. Initially positioned, where should it be? That D-ring in the center of my back, right? So you can see that it stretched somewhat when I get into this fall scenario. And that's a, that's a pretty good position right now. I'm somewhat comfortable. If I had the D-ring a little bit too high, what's going to happen is I may be more upright in a more upright position, and it may cause this, this chest strap to potentially choke me. And if I had it too far down my back, I could be hanging like Superman and laying out a lot. And we've seen that when we've actually had this demonstration done in classes before. Um, actually, people come in with their own harnesses and own uh, setups, and then we hang them and we see where it actually uh, works out. So it's, it's a nice way to actually train our employees is by doing something like this in a controlled scenario like Harry was mentioning. But uh, it, it's nice to be able to see what they have and, and help them to understand a little bit more. So I'm going to start off with the, uh, the lifeline loop. And what I do is, if you notice, I'm going to start on the inside of my foot. So the line should come from the inside of my foot. okay? And then I come back over like this, and actually bring it around here. I'm going to get this out here a little bit, somewhat difficult. So I've got it in that situation right here. And then I can actually bring this up a little bit, OK? And I'm twisting a little bit here. All right, and I can actually stand up and relieve all that pressure from those thigh straps, OK? And if I want, I can actually bring this rope up higher. <coughs> And actually, let's get this here. So I can stand more comfortably. Again, <laughs> spin me around a little bit there. But I can actually get to this. Now, one of the nice things is, when I get to this position, look what I could grab out with these. If I went back to that other position, there is a strap that goes down, and it would very well pinch that phone off, and I would be unable to get it. So that was the first rescue technique, or a technique that I'm able to actually take that pressure off felt amazing. I actually felt a heck of a lot better as soon as I got into that position. 
The second one I want to train uh, today is actually going to be that, that loop here. And so what I do is I try to get this in a position. And this is where we were talking about that ladder rescue system. Uh, it's really hard to get a big boot or any type of system into a loop. So you want to make sure one of the big things you do with this is make sure that, that loop is big enough. If I tie one that, that is, that's that big, it's going to be hard for my foot to fit around it, right? So what I typically do is I'll actually take this down, I'll get it around my shin, and then I'm going to come back around here, and I just tie a knot in a line. Then I can put my foot into it and actually stand up and relieve the pressure. If I want, during this time, if I make the loop too long or if I make it too short, I can actually come back and I can actually set that loop a little bit higher to relieve even more, to relieve even more of that pressure. So I'm going to come back around here. As you can see, it's pretty high right now, but if I get my foot into there, I can actually get up and stand up and do that same thing that we did with the other loop relatively easily. And once again, you can actually hear my voice a little bit better now too. It relieves a lot of that pressure uh, from this area and I can feel my legs coming back. When I hang there for a long period of time, I can actually have issues with, it almost feels like my legs are falling asleep and I can feel the tingling in my feet. So now that we've got those two techniques, we can take that away real quick. I can show you the other straps. So now these are the built-in straps and they can be purchased for anywhere from $15 to $20. They can be add-ons or they can actually come with the harness. And the nice thing about this one is we've got it pre-cut. So we know our height, we know, we know what size we are, and we know where this needs to be. And the thing about this system, it has a little hook and it has a little area where I would hook that into. So, if I were to use this prior to, or if I understand that this harness is only mine and this rescue device is only mine, what I would do is actually take this and cut it to the height that I want it. Therefore, when I'm actually in a false scenario, I don't have to search for the proper loop to hook it into. So I know, for example, that this is my height. I'm gonna hook it right into the one that's actually set up for me. Go ahead here. Nice thing is, a little bit difficult to get there. So now this loop is hanging between my legs and I can actually take and step one foot in, step the second foot in, and go from there. For $20, I've got a system that actually relieves all that pressure once again from these, from these arteries. All right? So one other thing that I wanted to show you, and the nice thing with this harness is it's, a, it's, it's got the nice padding on it, but I wanted to show you this, is that I can actually take from this position and actually try and lower these leg straps a little bit to a point now where can you see what I'm doing? I'm actually sitting and all that pressure once again has been relieved from here. I don't even need this strap around my feet anymore because now I'm actually in a sitting position and it's relieved a lot of that pressure. Okay, And that can actually be done from any of those other techniques or even from a technique where I have none of these other devices. And what it's doing is just relieving a lot of that pressure from the inside of my thighs. And this is one thing that you can do. You know, we've kind of demonstrated things with a rope grab. The suspension trauma straps and turning the harness into kind of a bosun's chair works with an SRL. So if you have workers who are going to be in the SRL, it's important for them to know that they can do something. And putting your harness into this kind of bosun's chair position is one thing, the suspension trauma strap is another. I'm going to let Rich down so Now, now as Harry was mentioning earlier too, if you're going to do this in a classroom situation, make sure that you do have that comfort uh, level for the employees. You know, it isn't fun hanging up there and, and definitely it's one of those things that you should be doing with practice many times. The, uh, the easiest way I would say to do it is just get them up enough so that their feet are actually touching on the floor mm -hmm. as well. That's enough to actually get them to be able to do the uh, examples of what we've just shown you. So one of the things, let me point out something too, what Rich was, Rich was doing there. Now he's you know, in good shape and everything, uh, which of course many of your workers are too. But I would practice, one of the good things about hanging here is getting him, to, you still were launched pretty, pretty forward and you really shouldn't be that yeah. forward. 
because it makes it that much more difficult to be maneuvering when you're launched anywhere for it. So you really need to be a little bit more vertical uh, to do this better. And you saw how difficult it was, even under the best circumstances. I mean, he's using the poles and everything, which of course you wouldn't have, uh, to make those loops and everything. Which just again shows how using that strap is, you know, 20 really bucks, 15 bucks, it's just, yeah. it's just there for you. So two things, one of them is hanging your employees from one of these things so they can see actually how their harness works. His particular harness has this delta patch behind him. You can actually fall out of your harness backwards. Turn around so you can see that. See that patch there? Harry, why don't you point that out? This whole area kind of, if, if this D-ring goes way too high on harnesses that may not have that, that pad, then you have that opening that may be more significant. This one has, a, <laughs> has an extra strap there. But it's what Tom's talking about is, if this is on this way, that that worker maybe could come backwards this way if this D-ring is too high over their head. So that's why really understanding how to get these harnesses on a person correctly is important. And the best way of doing it is hanging them from one so they can see what they do. If they start launching forward, like Rich wasn't too bad, but we've had them where they look like he said Superman. But even there, it's too far forward. If you're literally hanging, you should try it. It's really difficult to do the stuff he was doing. And, and, and it is, it's so important. I mean, we've had companies up to 200 employees that we had, we had two tripods set up during the meeting and during the fall protection class and all 200 employees went through. And it was amazing the percentages of people that didn't have their harnesses set up correctly. You could see even me. I had my chest straps where they should have been at the beginning, but once I got hung, there's enough stretch in those harnesses that you do need to prepare for that. And you do need to understand that, wow, I should really set this up ahead of time so that I can see exactly what's possibly going to happen during a potential fall. Um, that, that chest strap itself, you know, if, if you're in a fall scenario and maybe you don't have it set up properly where your arresting force is going to be correct, just imagine that, that chest strap actually coming up around your neck or around your head. Um, that could be potentially, could potentially break your neck right there. So.